Why is it so important that we get clear on these three E's? As, as I've been doing research and talking with leaders um, over the last several years, it's, you know, what does it take to build an engaged, flourishing team? And the three E's have just kind of emerged in this research. So uh, making sure that there is empathy in the organization, making sure, especially by the leadership team, making sure that there's proper empowerment. And so, and I've often said the worst thing that organizations do is they hire people, especially high, highly talented or, um, they, or leaders, and then they do not let them do what they were hired to do. You know, it's just like, that doesn't make any sense to me, uh, but it happens a lot. And then the third thing is excellence, being committed to excellence. What is up, Action Taker? Welcome back to the After Hours Entrepreneur, your guide to building up the first six-figure year of your business. I'm, of course, your host, Mark Savant, and today we've got a banger for you. We are joined by Matt Lesser. Matt is an experienced team leader who really focuses his coaching practice on helping leaders become their best selves and motivating their best teams. And by the way, reaching fulfillment, because let's face it, it can be lonely at the top. And the last thing that we wanna do is build our own prisons. Heck, that's why we left the nine to five job. That's why we're building our own businesses. It's because we want that freedom, we want the purpose, and we want the satisfaction out of life. And that, my friends, is what today's episode is all about. In fact, that's what Matt's new book, Unsatisfied, When Less Is More, is all about. Banger book, I'm going to put a link below, definitely worth checking out. We cover a lot of great topics today. The overarching theme is, again, building a business that gives you joy. And you can do that through building the right team, leveraging stories to understand yourself better, surrounding yourself with the right people, communicating with your partner or spouse, a lot of really practical stuff that you're going to walk away from in this episode. So buckle up, get ready for an amazing episode with Mr. Matt Lesser. And by the way, special shout out to Matt. Thank you for sponsoring today's episode. DJ, you know what to do. Run the tape. Matt, what's up? Hey, how you doing, Mark? Matt, I am awesome, rocking and rolling, and excited to talk shop with you here today. You've done a lot in your few years here on Earth, and uh, just looking to dive in and, and kind of take a chip off of that old brain block there and get some wisdom. Hey, man, I'm ready to go. I've been looking forward to this, and uh, so, hey, let's go. Love it, love it, love it. So you've got a great story. You started work in the family business years ago when you were just a kid. Yeah. Um, and as it evolved, you kind of grew yourself, which is, which is natural. And you end up getting caught up in a corporate executive role that maybe didn't give you the fulfillment that you really wanted. And you ended up leaving that role to start your coaching business. Can you just walk me through what your mindset was and what that was like leaving the stability of a corporate job to do your own thing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, it was, uh, you know, when I, when I was in the family business, and I, I have to say that I, I got into it reluctantly. It wasn't actually what I uh, was planning on doing. Um, but hey, that's, uh, that's just the way it worked out. God had different plans for me. And so, uh, but with the, the business um, started out really rough and uh, went through a really hard time there uh, mentally, emotionally, um, which is very common uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs that are starting out, you know, because you're, you're struggling just to live day to day at times. And so, um, so I went through that and I went through a deep depression um, and uh, was almost, almost, my life was almost a whole lot shorter on this earth than you just mentioned. So, um, but grateful that uh, came out of that and grew out, grew a lot and uh, learned a lot. And, uh, the, and from that point forward, the, uh, we started the business over actually, and it, it really, it grew. And so uh, I got to the point that I had to make a hard decision. And the decision was, and how am I gonna leverage everything plus to go to the next level. And at that point we had, um, you know, a couple hundred employees, we had uh, good sales and, and, uh, and I had a couple of competitors that were interested and that I knew would take care of our employees. And so that's what we chose to do. And then uh, I did go into corporate and- um, I'm sorry, so you sold the business? I did, I sold it because I, they, I, I wanted it to be in good hands going forward. And I didn't want to risk the livelihood of my employees uh, for ego primarily. And so 
that was a decision to me. It was a hard decision, but um, and I look back on it to this day, and I still wonder. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Matt. Well, we always we always wonder, right? Hindsight's fifty fifty. I'm wondering, what did your wife say when you told her I'm selling the business? I'm going to go do this new thing. What was her mentality when you broke the news? She was on board with it. Actually, she really was, um, because it, it was it was literally it was it was at the stage where um, it was fun. I mean, it was we were no longer having to worry about how to make payroll. Um, which is a challenge. That's a whole stage of development in itself, right? And I often said that that was actually the most fun I had in business. <laughs> sounds weird, sounds crazy, but I'm serious. Uh, because you're constantly in a battle, and, and I love the battlefield. And then when you get past that, then the problems, you still have problems to solve, but they change. And so we had gotten to the point where the problems we're trying to solve were uh, now going to affect a lot of people. And, and that was the part that kept me up at night. Uh, the stress level went through the roof. And so by the time I um, got to the point of saying, hey, honey, it's, we, it, this is the right thing to do, she said, I agree with you. So I had a similar conversation with my partner, with my wife, and which I think is important, right? If you're gonna make a big life choice, like selling a business, leaving a job, uh, starting a new business, it's like pretty important that you have that conversation with your partner, Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. Yeah. And very, you know, leading up to it, she was very much like she, she was into it. But once I pulled the trigger and I quit, she was just kind of like, oh, <laughs> now it's real. Did she, yeah. was it, was there, was there any of that going on or was she just like, she was on board the whole time? She, um, if she did have that kind of a moment, then, uh, she kept it to herself. Um, I think the one thing that made it a little bit easier is that I already had a, a role to go into. Um, a friend and mentor of mine was starting a private equity firm and asked me to join. And it was the early stages of that. And so it wasn't like I was selling and then going to sit around and, and do nothing for, you know, whatever. Um, and so I think that helped. And uh, so I, but I don't, that's a great question. I never, I never asked her if she ever had those feelings of, oh crap, what did you just do? <laughs> so. Well, it's good. I mean, I think it's smart that you had the stability to move into the next thing. Yeah. When I left my corporate job, my insurance agency, I already had an infrastructure. I'd been building out the infrastructure for my podcast agency for, for, for several years. And it was finally to a point where like, okay, there's, there's enough breadcrumbs here that I could convince her to, to go along with the idea. Uh, but, but to your point, if you're not happy, that impacts everybody around you. It does. It does. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It, it, it's not worth selling your soul to do something that that makes you unhappy. And it certainly isn't it, it going to do any favors for your marriage no. or your kids and, and so on and so forth. No, it's not. So what was the next, what was the next position, Matt? What, what, what did you do next when you went to the private equity? What was that transition like? So that transition was, um, it was weird, uh, quite frankly, because when you're, when you're used to being, you know, your own boss and setting your own schedule and doing your own thing, I mean, obviously I, I worked my tail off, but, um, and to all of a sudden go into a whole lot more structure with, you know, expected hours and, and all that stuff. I, uh, it took me, I'd say it took me a good year to year and a half to find my sea legs there. And, um, and it, it did a whole lot of different stuff because we were, we were basically a startup. Well, not basically we were, we were a startup. Uh, we were a well-funded startup, but we were a startup nonetheless. And so, um, and so it was probably about a year and a half into it that I found my groove in working, uh, with another gentleman there and, and for, uh, for the next, basically for half my time there, uh, he and I, uh, led the operations of the business. And, uh, and that was, I, I, I look back on that, um, as probably the, the, the most fun, most fulfilling, most rewarding, most satisfying stretch of my career. Um, it was just, I loved going to work. I loved working with this guy. Uh, we got along really well. We were very different. And so, um, if, when you read the book in the back of the book, I give practical exercises and a couple of them are using assessments and, uh, in a healthy way, I know assessments can be a double-edged sword, but, um, if you look at, if you look at the way we are wired though, we were opposite and it was really one plus one is greater than two. And so, so anyway, did that for uh, six years. In the next six years, I I was in. Um, I did a lot of traveling. Uh, was traveled all over the world. Uh, was gone a lot and um, looking for investment opportunities. And then um, it just got to the point that, like you mentioned in the beginning, um, I started to. What what happened? There's two things that happened. First, um, my kids were getting older. Second. Um, I began working with a whole lot of leaders and leadership teams, um, literally and on different continents and, and here in this country as well. 
I began to, as I talk with them, I began to see a pattern because I heard the same story over and over and over again. And so it wasn't like it was a one off or two off or three off. It was a pattern. And the, and the story was this. Oftentimes I was talking with founders, owners of businesses. They had grown the company to a certain level. Um, oftentimes it was successful and they had reached a point of saying, wow, I sacrificed all of this. I sacrificed my family. I sacrificed time. I sacrificed whatever. Now, yeah, I might have a good life. I have all the things and stuff that I could imagine and, and want. I have position. I have freedom to a certain degree. Um, but I, but literally, literally it's, it's like, this is it. This is, this is the life that I hope for. And, and they just became extremely um, unsatisfied. And, you know, many times you'd see, I would say, you shouldn't say many, but uh, some of the time you'd see the classic midlife crisis behaviors. And, and I, I was reaching the same point. I was, I was in my, um, I was in my early forties at the time. And uh, it's like, okay, wait a minute. I'm on a similar path here. And I was already beginning to feel the pain of being gone a lot, missing my, my kids, my wife, and feeling that pressure when I got back home. And so, um, so finally, uh, literally in uh, well, one day, I was uh, actually, I was presenting a budget for uh, the upcoming, uh, upcoming year. And uh, um, at the end of the conversation, I resigned. Wow. And my wife did not know that. My wife knew that it was a possibility but I did not tell her the when and the where. <laughs> so Okay, so you're kind of like floating the idea around the dinner table yeah. and then all of a sudden you're like, "All right, I'm I'm you know, you want to do lunch on Monday morning, I'm free." Like, what did she say when you delivered that message to her? Was she like, "Okay, now it's game time?" Was she supportive? Was she scared? What was the response that you got? I think it was all the above. So, I called her. So, I did it at the end of the day and I called her um I literally, I resigned and went and got my my backpack and got in my truck and I started to drive home. I could use my first phone call. And I told her what happened and there was this long pause and then I can hear sniffling. And literally I'm like, oh crap. And I, I just said, honey, I we <laughs> talked about this. Um, you know, I thought I thought we were on the same page here. And, and literally she said, no, 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 no. She says, these are not tears of sadness. And I said, what? And she said, I have been praying for three years that something would break here, something would give, um, and that you would move on. And she said, it was, t it's been time. It is time. And so I said, okay, I'm moving on and I don't exactly know what's next, but, uh, uh, I had a couple things in the, in the works. And so, um, and so she's like, we'll be fine. So that was the conversation. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, you chose a good one there for you to have a partner that supports you like that is, is big time. It's, oh, it's yeah. hard. To, I mean, and like, listen, I, I find for a lot of after hours entrepreneurs, we're going out on our own, we're doing our own thing, especially when you're in that, that idea formulation to six figure year. Yeah. There, the, the vast majority of people I find don't believe in you. They're not like, you've got this. Most people are like, why don't you just stick to what you know? Yeah. Why take the risk? Mark, you got bills, you got family and I'll tell you what, to have a partner that stands behind you and is like, we'll figure this out, that is invaluable. Oh my. That, I mean. Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, I, I don't think I could, you know, that could be an entire book on itself. It's, 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 so, it's so important. But what, what strikes me about this quick, you know, to kind of segue a little bit here, Matt, uh, it, it doesn't sound like you actually had an entire business infrastructure in place. So you left the corporate job. What's the next thing that you did? I went into banking for um, a little under a year and I'm not a banker. And so that was a, uh, that I learned a lot, don't get me wrong, but it was just not for me. And I knew it uh, the first weekend. And so um, I had actually been doing some work for this particular team prior to going there, uh, working with their leadership team and their board of directors. And so which I really liked them all. And, uh, but it just wasn't for me. So I left that and then, um, at that point, I actually incorporated, I'm, and I incorporated, I formed an LLC, and I was going to go on to, uh, into my own thing. So uh, the name of my company is called Uniquely Normal, and it's very intentional why I chose those words, and we can talk about that if you'd like to. But, uh, but I started the company, and then COVID hit. And so it's very difficult to um, get face-to-face -face meetings and try to build a clientele base if uh, you can't actually meet in person. And especially when, you know, people thought the world was ending. And so, so for six months, 
I did a whole lot of reading and preparation and getting ready to get ready. And then um, a friend of mine who's, I was on his board for several years and uh, he was, he had a family business as well. And his stage of evolution was he needed to build an executive team. And so he called me and said, hey, would you come on board? And, uh, and I said, sure. So it took us about a year to get that done. And then, um, and, and he knew that I wanted to do what I'm doing. And so we, uh, so we parted ways, that was last July. And uh, at that point I did, I went full time into what I'm doing now. By that point I had started writing the book. Um, and, uh, but from July until January of this year, my primary focus was getting that book done. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So I, I definitely want to hear more about the book because you, you're, you talk about a lot of interesting concepts in there. The business itself, the uniquely normal, right? It, in it, in it, one of the things I think that you did, Matt, which makes a lot of sense to me is, is understanding the audience, the client that you want to help and understand the problem that they had. Like you mentioned just a moment ago, there's common denominators that you saw continuing to manifest across all these leaders. <laughs> So you've got an idea of who you want to help. You've got an idea of the problem. Now that you finally developed a solution, what was your next step? How did you land your first client? Um, my, it was a, uh, through relationships. I mean, um, yeah, I have a website and, and all that good stuff, but it was just through relationship. I had a, uh, I had, um, a person that I worked with actually when I was in a corporate position and he had left too. And, uh, he called me up one day and he said, Hey, he says, our leadership team needs some help. And, um, and I love working with leaders and leadership teams. Um, my focus with the, with the business side of it really is on building healthy, engaged teams, starting with the leadership teams. And so, um, so he asked me, he's like, would you come in and do a, you know, a half day seminar for us on how to use um, a, a particular assessment that they had taken? And uh, so would you come in and do a half day seminar for us on this assessment and teach us how to be healthier together relationally and function more, uh, function better as a team. And so that one, and that led to several other meetings with them as well. So that was how, that's how it happened. And most of my other clients have just come through word of mouth and relationship. On a scale from one to 10, how anxious, how nervous were you going into that first presentation? Um, I was a little anxious. I was, I wouldn't say that I was, I was a little nervous. I wouldn't say I was anxious, um, because it was something that I had done many times before. And, um, and, 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 and okay. I had done this actually when I, that's how this guy thought of me because I had done it many times where we worked together for other organizations. And so, but I was, um, but I have to say I was nervous because it was the first time it was under my own umbrella. You know, we always been under other people's umbrellas before, but this was the first time this was like, oh my God, this is, this is my baby now, you know? And when I submitted my invoice, it's like, this is, this is my first invoice. And so I, I've got it literally framed. So it's <laughs> let's go, let's go. There's nothing, there's nothing better. I think than and you'd kind of done a little bit of this, but there's nothing better than making that jump from employee to employer. Obviously there's a lot of challenges yep. that come along the way, but it's just, it's so there, there's nothing quite like it paving yeah. your own way, making your own way. Yeah. And you know, when, when we talk about your book unsatisfied, I, you know, if, if you had to sum me up working my job, my previous job, that was it. Yeah. That was it. There was no, there was like there, I was, I was hit at a ceiling that there just wasn't anywhere farther to go. Yeah. Right. And for me taking that leap, like the after hours entrepreneurs out there are doing was how I got that next level of being, of being like, wow, there's so much to do. Yeah. There's so much to do. There but is that, but that being said that it, you know, one of the things that I think that you really, you really carve out well in this book is getting to that point where you're satisfied when you reach kind of the pinnacle. And, and that kind of got me thinking about a concern that I had early on. And that's, I don't want to build my own prison. Mm, yeah. I don't want to build a job that doesn't satisfy me. Yeah. So what do you, how do you think, how do you think that we go about building something that satisfies us? How do, how do we know that we're on the right track, Matt? Save me. <laughs> well, um, I, I, there's no magic formula, you know, and people, people ask me a lot when I'm, especially if I'm working with clients, they're like, Hey, what's your, you know, what's, the, what's the process for, to get from here to there. And yes, there is a process, uh, but it's not a formula. 
um, you cannot put together a formula when you're working with people, right? It's just way too difficult to do that, but there are principles and processes that you can use. And so when it comes to, you know, how do you build something that is going to bring you um, satisfaction and purpose and meaning in your own life um, for, for, you know, for days, weeks, months, years to come. Um, and, and I think it comes down to some uh, four things. And I talk about this in the book. One is, what are you passionate about? Second is, what are you really good at doing? How are you skilled? How are you gifted? Um, the third one is, how do other people affirm you? You know, when you do something, when you do this, you know, people say, wow, where did that come from? You know, I didn't know you could do that, or I didn't know you knew that. And the fourth one is, what is your calling? Because I believe that each of us have an, an, an inner calling to something. You know, it might be something when we're little kids. You know, I can't tell you how many kids I will talk to and say, what do you want to be in your group? Oh, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a police officer. I want to, you know, whatever. I want to be a big corporate giant. That's, that's fine. If that's what you're called to do, and I, and I talk about this in the book too, um, reaching the pinnacle, which is flourishing. You know, so many people, um, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions right now of, well, it seems like, you know, when people are thriving, you know, and I use this example specifically in the book of big time executives that are thriving or business owners or whatever, and uh, they're making a lot of money, they have this and they've sacrificed so much, but they're not satisfied. And so it's like, so am I supposed to just give that all away? And the answer is no, because guess what? There are people at the flourishing level, these high power executives at the flourishing level, because it intersects with the four things I just gave you. They're passionate about doing it, they're called to it, they're really good at doing it, and other people affirm them in it. Um, it's just a matter of what are you focused on? And and really it comes down to purpose and meaning. You know, and, and what I'm, is what I'm doing purposeful? Is it meaningful um, at my core? And so I think if you put all that together, then you're on your way to living a flourishing life and, uh, and, and everything that goes with that. Is that helpful? It, it is. And it, it really strikes a chord with me, Matt. I, I, I just don't think there's any way that you can have a satisfied life if you're not spending your time on your why, if you don't feel like you actually have some sort of purpose. Yep. And, you know, to, to that effect, I think that was part of the problem that I had in my, my previous position, it felt very commoditized. But what I, what I also think about too, is that our why can change. Mm -hmm. You know, our passion will probably stay fairly consistent, but you know, our purpose changes as we go up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as our family goes through different stages. Like life moves through seasons, Yep. you know? So how do you go about, and you've, you've gone through seasons too, clearly I have, I think everybody has. Yeah. How do you go about redefining or re-examining what phase of life you're in and how to get more clarity on what to do next? Oh, that's a, wow. That's a, that, that's, that's a hard question, man. I think you, uh, I think you, you must have a, a PhD in question asking, man. You're asking some really good ones. Um, <laughs> I think that hey, listen, uh, when I get when I get experts on the mic, I don't waste the opportunity, bro. I'm I'm getting we're in it to win it here, baby. I guess so, man. Wow. Um, so I think I think for I think everyone's probably a little bit different in how they about evaluate it. Uh, for me, it means I I'm intentionally thinking about that. And so literally for me, every quarter I go away for two and a half days. Now, the primary purpose of those two and a half days is spiritual in nature. So it's a spiritual retreat just to spend time with God. And, um, but in those, in those times, then I'm evaluating and thinking about, okay, is, 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 is my attitudes and my behaviors consistent with who I say I am and who I want to be? And am I living out my purpose? And if I'm not, it was these questions that got me to the point of saying, I am no longer a fit for what I'm doing. And I didn't hate what I was doing, but it just wasn't a fit anymore because it wasn't aligned to my core purpose in being and calling. And so, you know, so I don't know if it's a, um, I don't know if it's a quarterly evaluation that's probably a, a, on the excessive side, but um, I would say annually, biannually to really just get away. And, and I do recommend this to any leader um, or anyone that is considering making a change is don't do it without number one with counsel. And I do say and check it, your spouse, your fi actually spouse first, counsel and time. You know, you need time to really think about this, get away. If you can get away for a long weekend or get away even for a week or something uh, and, and not 
not necessarily spend a whole lot of time in activities, but just thinking, praying, journaling, whatever, whatever it takes for you to be able to open up the doors to your heart a little bit and say, okay, what am I doing now? What, what am I gifted doing? What do I want to do next? What, where's my purpose? Where's my meaning? Where's my calling? And I think that um, you, it's amazing what you begin to find when you take the time and create the space for that. I like that. Taking time, taking space, trusted counsel, partner, and, and listening to yourself. I, I, I just want to point out, everyone, that one of the things that Matt didn't mention was spending an hour a day browsing TikTok for advice. That was not on the short list of, of things to do to find purpose. Uh, no. You know, uh, anyway, I, di I digress. And I, I got this actually from Tim Ferriss. I was listening to his podcast, The Tim Ferriss Show. And, you know, he's talking about morning ritual. He never starts off his day looking at social media. That's always like, you know, an hour, two hours into the wake up routine. So I, I just want to point out, like, it's very easy to be unfulfilled when the first thing you do is check your Instagram or your, or your TikTok. And I'm a guy who's, listen, I believe in, in the power of social media. I'm all over social media. Um, but golly, if you get too, if you get too invested in looking to others on social media for the likes and the comments and the shares for validation, that. I think that's actually, it's probably one of the biggest problems that we have with um, per personal health and mental health in the, in the country today, but that's another Amen bag of worms, right? Yeah. Well, and I would add to that, Mark, because I think you bring up a very good point. Um, when you create time and space, you got to turn the cell phone off, turn the computer off um, because you can't really be effective at introspection and reflection and thinking if you're distracted every time your, your, your stinking phone goes off, right? So just shut the stupid thing off. And, you know, even if it means for like three days, um, you know, tell somebody where you're at, give them an emergency phone number or whatever, but then turn the stupid thing off and spend time actually doing what you went to do. And I think you're right about social media. I mean, it, be, it becomes, it can become an addiction. In fact, I just read a study on this that talks about the chemical composition, the chemical uh, reaction in the brain that happens when we spend all this time on social, uh, especially when we get so emotionally attached to, oh my gosh, you know, that post only got five likes. And, you know, and I do some of the same stuff. If I release a post on LinkedIn and, oh, that one got me, you know, a hundred, that one got me two. What's wrong with me? Nothing wrong with me. It's just whatever. So anyway, sorry, I digress. But it's, it's, to, to your point, I think it is important that you identify if, if, if a particular post gets a lot of engagement, okay, that's, yeah. that's a hint. That's a clue that I probably want to be doing more of that. My audience wants to see more of that, but you know, you, you, you can't live or die based on that stuff. It's not, it's, it's not going to work. And, and, and by the way, the ads that you see, the apps are so well designed to keep you hooked and to make you oh. help you or coax you in a way I made, I completely swapped. I completely changed my diet based off watching like 90 seconds of a YouTube ad. Like completely changed my diet. It, it, did it, it, like, did it work? I, I mean, it, it was it was fine. Like I, I I I wasn't going to the hospital or anything. But That's good. you know, basically, I was I was I was going into this intermittent fasting diet, and I wasn't mm. eating at certain times, and I was eating only things at certain times based off a random YouTube stranger that had a six pack. I was like, oh well, that that makes sense. I'll do that. So anyway, I think when you're introspective, when you're when you're around a trusted group of people. That I think is is a is is better is is a better way of finding that that upper meaning, yeah, if, as absolutely. it were. Absolutely. Well, and I love what you said too. You you said finding your why, and I think that is so key. You know, what is your why? Why do you think you're on this earth? I mean, we're here for such a short time period, and I don't know about you, but I want to maximize and optimize the time that I'm here. And that doesn't mean that I mean, that doesn't mean working. 60, 70, 80, 90 hours a week. I did that at, at, during, at, at, during, a time, during a season, as you mentioned, a season. I'm not doing that anymore. Um, number one, I just, that's not, that's not living, right? That's, that's, I do not live to work. I work to live. I like that. I like it. And, and like you said, when you, when you knock out these other things, passion, what are you great at? How are people affirming me? What's my why? What's my calling? It, it, it's, yeah. it start, it starts to make sense, right? One of the, um, one of the things that I heard, I've heard you talk about, Matt, is the importance of writing out your story. And mm -hmm. I just kind of want to lay this up, lay this up to you because I didn't really, I didn't really, I think, fully appreciate how important understanding and telling your story is. But tell me, why, 
is it so important that we write out our story? Um, I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One, I think because when we look back on our life, we realize at the times in our lives where we realize where we were and where we are now. And it oftentimes gives us hope for where we're going in the future. So I think that's the first one. The second one is to have your story memorialized, to be able to share that with your kids, your grandkids. Um, I think that there's something special. I know I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very concerned about legacy and how family values, family beliefs are passed on. I think that we were losing some of that in our current generation. And I think part of it, quite frankly, is because of the distractions all around us, especially social media. You know, families, it, when we have family, when we have dinner as a family, for example, there are no cell phones allowed at the table, period, um, because we want that time. But writing your story, too, I think does something um, about connecting with your inner self and really knowing who you are. And, um, you know, it's difficult to answer the hard questions of why if I don't even understand the what. And so what is my story and who am I really? Who, what and who, who am I? Where did I come from? Um, and both the good and the bad, you know, and I, I get, um, I get pushed back on this because some people's stories are really, really painful and I get that. And so if, in those cases, I say, fine, you don't have to write out the nitty gritty details. Um, you know, do it in such a way that it's not going to bring you to, um, you're not going to have to relive it. Um, but don't necessarily just gloss over it either if, if, if you can, you know, obviously don't force anybody. And then Mark, I'll tell you one thing too, is that whenever I work with um, a team, especially a leadership team, one of the first things that I do is I will get them in a room, hopefully off site. That's the best if you can, if not, that's fine too. And literally say, share your stories with each other. And I don't mean the Cliff Stones version. I mean the full version. And then sometimes, you know, some of them will let, some of them have taken as much as 45 minutes to an hour sharing their stories. And at the end of that time, I mean, people are, people oftentimes are in tears. Um, they're literally saying things like, I've worked with you for 20 years. I didn't know that about you. And the, the, um, the longitudinal effect of that is there's more empathy, there's more caring, there's more understanding. And those teams work together better because they take the time to do that. So. Anyway, I'll stop preaching. <laughs> I mean, no, that's that's great. You know, it, historically and, and currently, when I think about the importance of storytelling, I think about it as a way to really connect with other people. Yep. Because we often, I think, get inside our own heads and think, I'm the only one who went through this. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one with the abusive parent or the drug problem or the kid that hates me or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. But... It, you know, other people are going through it too. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it really helps, I think, connect on a deeper level. I mean, storytelling in general, the, the, the problem that I ran into, and I think a lot of people run into is saying to themselves, well, my story isn't interesting <laughs> or I don't have a story to tell. Yeah. But to your point, like, I think once you start writing it down and breaking it down, you have more of a story than you think. Absolutely. And, and that's the power of story. You know, I have, there are all kinds of team building exercises you can do, all kinds of assessments you can take. But quite frankly, Mark, I have not found anything more powerful than just sharing story. And, and I think to your point, people begin to understand, it's like, oh, okay, now I have a better appreciation for, for you know, my coworker here when, when this happens or that happens, or man, I had no idea that was in your background. It was interesting. Uh, a few years ago, I was speaking at a conference, and at the end of the conference, at the end of the at the end of my time speaking, there was an open Q and A, and um, I was speaking on on leadership and leadership development. And I happened to just throw in. I was not sharing my story, but I happened to throw in there that I had gone through a suicidal depression early in my career when when I took over the family business and actually it, it failed out of the out of the shoots. And when all the Q and A came in, that Q and A was focused on that part of my story, uh, that part of my speech, and it wasn't even the focus. Because to your point, wow, they didn't understand. They 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 went through the same thing, and they thought that they were all alone in it, and so they wanted to, um, they just wanted to share. So it was just so interesting. I, I I absolutely love that. You know, personally, we talk about team building. Stories are really important to to building teams and building organizations as well. I 
you know, we, we kind of alluded to this earlier or before the interview, actually, I'm, I'm in between assistants right now. My old assistant moved to Spain and he's focusing on school and he really wants to work with me, but he just, he just doesn't have the bandwidth to do it. Yeah. And so what I did is I went back to the well and I started talking to team members that I've worked with in the past. And one of my team members said, you know, we we're kind of talking about the budget and the, you know, the cost, you know, the, uh, the, the compensation. When I said, Mark, honestly, even if you weren't paying me anything, I'd still want to be a part of it. And, wow. and I really think that speaks to the, he was just saying that I am paying him. Something, but I think that speaks a lot to the, the power of building a story and the power of building a mission and a vision for a company, for an agency. Yes. And I'm not doing anything that fancy. We're, you know, we're launching and producing podcasts for people. But when you build more into that, it's not just producing a podcast. It's, it's giving people a voice. It's giving yes. people breath. It's giving you the ability to reach new people and to connect into network and generate new streams of income and create structure and clarity, all this other stuff. Um, but I, I love this idea story. I've become completely fascinated with it. So I appreciate you kind of drilling down a little bit. My pleasure. I'm, I'm very, I'm passionate about that. I really am. The other, the other thing that, you know, I heard you mention, I'm not exactly sure where I mentioned, I got so many notes here. There's kind of all over the place here, but one of the things that I heard you, uh, you, you mentioned that there's, there's three E's, the three mm -hmm. E's empathy, empowerment, and excellent. Tell me, why is it so important that we get clear on these three E's? Um, you actually, you're, you're starting to tip into the next book that I'm writing because it's on this very topic right here. And so uh, it's on, um, it, it's basically, how do you create an engaged and excited team that is flourishing? And it starts by building flourishing individuals, which is the focus of Unsatisfied. And then those flourishing individuals then build flourishing organizations because organizations are people. And I think that too many organizations forget that at times. You know, people are not just a line on a, on a budget, they're people. And, and so how do we properly invest in people um, because they're the lifeblood of the organization? And so, um, and so as I've been working with people, working with leaders uh, for the last 20 years, it's, and especially now we have a, you know, you read about in the news, it seems like almost every day about having an unengaged workforce and you know, people that have quiet quitting and you know, all the open jobs we can't seem to fill and all this, all this stuff. And it's like, why is that the case? And so, um, and so what I, as, as I've been doing research and talking with leaders um, over the last several years, it's, you know, what does it take to build an engaged flourishing team? And the three E's have just kind of emerged in this research. So uh, making sure that there is empathy in the organization, making sure, especially by the leadership team, making sure that there's proper empowerment and so, and I've often said the worst thing that organizations do is they hire people, especially high, highly talented or, um, they, or leaders, and then they do not let them do what they were hired to do. You know, it's just like, that doesn't make any sense to me, uh, but it happens a lot. And then the third thing is excellence, being committed to excellence. Um, you know, nobody wants to play on a team where they're, where it's just mediocre, right? I mean, it's just, that's no fun to go to work and say, well, let's be mediocre today. No, that, but yet that's what happens many times. And so... So that's where the three E's kind of came from. And um, I'm unpacking those right now uh, in book number two. So so thanks for the lead into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, I mean, you know, it's funny. You started out not wanting to write any book. And now you're, you're working on book number two. So it's funny how life, life works when you start giving th different ideas a shot. You know, one of the things I think about excellence a lot because... <laughs> It's like every time I walk into a retail establishment or a restaurant or you know any any store really, they're doing the bare the people they're doing the bare bare minimum. Like if they notice you, like wow, this person, woo! I don't have to ring the bell, and you know I, I think that that can be really frustrating to a lot of people. I used to get angry, but now I don't get mad at all. You know, I, I'm just like that person is unfulfilled. They 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 aren't being pushed yep. to achieve. They aren't being pushed to to complete excellence. I kind of want to stay on that a minute because I think it's, it's it's really crucial to building a business. You have to empower other people to, to be excellent. Yep. One of the things that, that I've done within my organization is um, empowering people through education, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I'm reading like a really good book or if there's a book that I think can really help one of my teamers, like if you read it, I will buy it. I will send it to you. 
if you need a tool, I will buy it. I will give it to you. I yep. want you to have what you need to be excellent and be motivated. Is there anything else you'd recommend to motivating the people around us to be excellent? That is a uh, that's a great point. And um, so what I what I uh, what I do when I'm working with people, and it's actually again going to be in the book, is organizations are responsible when they hire somebody. They are responsible for, for providing the teaching, the training, the tools necessary, and making sure that the people have the skills necessary to do their job with excellence. What the people bring to the table is their motivation and their desire. And so, um, and so you talk about demotivation. So if you hire somebody and the onboarding process is, there's the toilet, there's the copy machine, now get to work. You know, what, what if I just communicated to that employee? You know, you just gave great examples and I see it too. But then I also see other examples of, of retail establishments where it's like, okay, wait a minute. There's something, there's something that, is, that is palpably different here. You know, you actually smiled, you you communicated, you actually gave eye contact. Wow. Um, and, and to me, it's like, okay, that's because you were communicated by a supervisor that cares about you enough. So they say, this is how you do your job. This is how you do it with excellence. And this is what excellence means. And I think that there are just too many places now because I, a part of it, I think, is they're desperate for help. And so they get a warm body and they say, great, we got a warm body and I'll get to work. But yet they don't. But they, they don't take the time to do all the stuff that's necessary: the onboarding, the training, the skill development, all that stuff that they need to be successful. And so they just feel like a number. I mean, it's like herding cattle for crying out loud. And, and it's a bad example, but or bad analogy. But um, when we treat people like that, that's what we're going to get. And it's wrong, from my perspective. Well, it's wrong both you know morally and professionally. You know, yeah. you're just not going to max. You're not going to get the most out of that that person if, like you said, you treat them. You know, here's the bathroom. Have a nice day. Get to work. And it's. It, I think it also starts at the top. Lead by example. You know, I'm. I'm in a men's group, and, you know, one of my my questions was, you know, how do I raise my kids? And my kids are very important to me. My first show, the Awesome Dad Show, is I started because I wanted to be a better dad, um, and, you know, I I think that my first initial approach to uh, to parenting and to business to say, these are all the things that you can't do. <laughs> this is what you must do. Yeah. I don't think that that works, ladies and gentlemen. And, you know, the advice that was given to me is you have to, you have to walk the walk, you know, you have to bear the right fruit. You need to be the example. Yep. And, and honestly, I think that's probably one of the biggest problems that we have in, in our culture. Now it's a lot of people telling everybody what to do. And then going behind the going going behind the scenes and doing the exact opposite. And people are smart enough; we can smell that crap, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, consistency or lack thereof, I think, is one of the things that people become disillusioned with leaders today because you know they're they're told this, and then they get behind the scenes and they say, "Oh, wow, you're nothing like that." And um, and you talk about again demotivating factors. It's and I think you're right. We focus so much on the knots and the negatives. And so what happens that, so if somebody tells me you can't do that, then I'm immediately going to say, okay, fine. If I can't do that, then I'm sure I can do this. And so I'm looking for a way around it. And, and rather than focused on how can I do my job with excellence, I'm, I'm constantly thinking, okay, they said, I can't do this. I can't do this. Can't do this. Well, I'm sure I can do this or this. And, and again, we're treating people like they're um, incompetent or, or that they're, they're not intelligent right out of the shoots, and then we wonder why we can't retain talent, or we're wondering why we can't fill talent. Well, because we treat them like they're not people, or we're treating them like they're all the same. That too. Right? Yeah. Some people want time off. Some people want the three-day weekend. Some people want more money. Some people want whatever the desire is. I think getting down. How do we actually figure that out, Matt? Is there anything that you do to try to get clear on what an individual wants from a job? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I recommend um, that any that every organization does to the, to the degree they can do it is um, a weekly one on one or at least biweekly. So if you can't, if it doesn't work in your schedules, do it weekly, do it biweekly. And in these one on ones, this is not a time for the supervisor to tell the person everything they're doing wrong. In fact, if that's what you're going to do, <laughs> then don't do it. Right. And so the way I tell them to do it is the first half, if it's for, let's just say it's an hour meeting. The first half an hour, supervisor, you don't say a word. You just look at the person and say, what can I do for you this week? 
and let the person talk for 30 minutes and you're not allowed to speak. You can take notes, but you cannot speak. Let the person talk. And then the second half an hour, you get to talk. But again, don't focus on the negatives. Don't focus on the negatives. Focus on what they were talking about. You know, yeah, sure, if you need to give instruction or need to talk about the job, that's fine. But oftentimes what winds up happening is more of a, um, you know, it becomes a lot more personal and it becomes, uh, and professional both. But that's where you begin to find out. And then I also recommend that people put together an annual development plan um, by person and say, these are the things that I want to grow in. These are the things I want to become. You know, this is what I'm passionate about. This is, um, and, and I recommend too in those things because those things can become so goal centric and they want to set, you know, 15 goals. You set 15 goals, you won't hit any of them. You set two, you'll get them both. And so set two, period, just set two. And I, I recommend one personal, one professional. And so, you know, there, again, Mark, there's no, there's no magic formula. And I think it's just a matter of remembering that, you know what, I'm a person and you're a person, you know, there was a day that I was sitting on the other side of that desk and how was I treated, you know, and, and, and maybe I wasn't treated well, but I have the opportunity to do this differently and to treat this person differently. And so I'm going to have a different conversation. And so it's just a matter of being intentional and really thinking through, okay, how do I want to be treated here? Right, well, I'll tell you what you brought up. I, that's, that's a book. I mean, that's just so good. And one of the things that really resonates with me is more listening, hmm. you know, because I've, I've been really focused on that specifically when it comes to sales, more on the sales side, because most of the time I'm talking to someone who's trying to sell me something. They're just, they keep talking and talking and talking. It's like, <laughs> I, I went to, I went to, to Honda the other day to get my car serviced. And before he had even seen my car before he even pulled it up in the computer. He told me four things that I needed. And I was like, bro, you don't even know the VIN yet. And you're oh. telling me what I need. Like, and, and I, anyway, I, I bring that up from a sales standpoint, but it, 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 it absolutely rings true. I think with, with team, with team building and employees, we, we tell them what they, what they need, or we assume. And if we just listen a little better, absolutely. We'll probably get a better result. Yep. Absolutely. Love that. So, we're, we're coming down to the end of our time here, Matt. And before we get into the world famous after hours entrepreneur rapid fire, that's right. It's a rapid fire. Surprise, surprise. It's coming. Tell us where's the best place we can find you, Matt. Um, so my, uh, my website is www.uniquelynormal, um, all together, uniquely And, uh, there you'll find my, uh, my contact information as well. My email is Matt at uniquelynormal.com. And so those are the two, probably the two best places. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, Matt Lesser, Matthew Lesser, I guess is the way I have it on LinkedIn. Matthew Lesser on LinkedIn. And so you can look me up there as well. Brilliant. And guess what? I'm gonna make it super easy. I'm just gonna put a link right there in the comments. So you don't even need, listen, there's a link right below. Just click it, check them out. Uh, Matt, you ready for the world famous rapid fire? You buckled up, you ready to go? Let's do this. It's getting real. It's getting real in here. Uh, Matt, if you could be any animal, what would you be? A lion. What is your favorite type of exercise? Uh, band resistance. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? Uh, Ireland, the West Coast. Ireland. Why? Why Ireland? Why? Why, why Ireland? Um, it was the uh, first international trip that my wife and I took together, and absolutely fell in love with it. Dig it. Dig it. Uh, what's the scariest movie you've ever seen? Um, uh, poltergeist as a kid. It probably wasn't that scary, but I was a kid. <laughs> Bro, any movie you watch as a kid, it's, it's remarkable how scary they can be. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer had me up for weeks. I couldn't sleep and that's a comedy, you know? So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what, uh, if you could sit next to anybody on an airplane, who would you sit next to? Oh, Eric Metaxas. Who's that? Eric Metaxas is a, uh, he has a radio show in New York City. He's also a published author. Um, he's a comedian as well. Uh, he's just somebody that I have looked up to for a very long time. Respect the heck out of him. Uh, just for the way he thinks, the way he speaks, um, what he writes about. And so he's been a, um, a thought leader, at least for me personally and for many others, uh, for a number of years. So I've, I'd love to have a conversation with Eric one-on-one. -on -one. Dig it. Dig it. You know, and, and just side note. 
everyone. That's one of the best reasons to have a podcast is you have an excuse for the Eric in your life to come and chat with you. So that's a pretty cool, uh, it's a pretty cool thing that I learned early on. Nice. Uh, final question here for you, Matt, before I let you go, if you could give yourself 10 seconds, 10 years ago, what would you say? Pursue your dreams sooner. That my friends is what being an after hours entrepreneur is all about. Matt, thanks for joining the show today, brother. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Have being on your show, Mark. Boom. That, my friends, is a wrap. Thanks for listening to today's episode with Matt. Make sure you check him out and show him some love. And if you enjoyed the episode, make sure you smash subscribe and leave that five-star review. It makes all the difference. Now it's your turn. You've got the tips. You've got the tools. It's time for you to go out and take action and make it happen. This has been the After Hours Entrepreneur. I'll catch you here next time. Peace.